I'm Chris Crudelli. I've spent my entire adult life studying martial arts and philosophy in the Far East. This series is my journey of exploration through that world. Meeting people who perform incredible feats of mind and body. Today, I'm going to look at the extremes that people go to to appease and invoke their gods. It's late September in southern Thailand and I've been told to brace myself for some gruesome sights at a local festival. This is the beginning of the vegetarian festival in Phuket. What this guy's doing is cutting his tongue with a blade. Mutilation starts today. This man's in a trance and he seems to feel no pain. That's because he claims to be possessed. Not by the devil, but by the gods. And he believes that by appeasing those gods, he can cleanse his village of evil. At first, I thought these guys were just throwing the axes around faking it. But then I saw the blood, and I realised they really are chopping into their own backs. As if that wasn't shocking enough, I was told that tomorrow it's going to get worse. I couldn't wait. Five a.m. In the temple, local men of Chinese origin start their day by putting themselves into a trance. This guy's man is absolutely crazy in here. <laughs> they just keep coming in. Look. What's he? What's he? They can appear themselves in order to appease their gods. Look at this, look at this. This is definitely not acupuncture. He's putting these things all up his body and they'll go all from his arms up through his face. They're everywhere. It's like Amateurville. Spikes are getting bigger and bigger. Can't be good for your health, can you? They are in an altered state of mind, and you'd have to be weak to have skewers pushed through your face and sort of almost not feel it. They're sort of displacing, displacing their mind. These villagers believe the more extreme the piercing, the more the gods are appeased. And look at that face, mate. It's a bloke with a huge javelin through his face. You know, everyone's just having a fag. What a bizarre place. Check this one out. This is the biggest spike at the party. Once everyone's pierced who wants to be, they set off round town in a procession. Look at this, this is the bizarrest one. They've got a turtle spitting out holy water. So on everybody. Look, they're all getting a bit of holy water. Well, let's get a bit, let's have a bit. Bless. Now I know this looks and feels more like a carnival than an important religious festival but the locals believe that miracles are actually happening. So once they've pierced themselves, they've got possessed. He's got the spirit in his body, that's why he's giving them the fruit. You see, see how thankful they are, because they think that fruit's going to bring them luck and fortune. 
This um, the, the spirit monk that will give us for um, like uh, if we eat this thing, it means that it's very good to, to our health and our family. Like good luck. Oh right, okay. It's a, a miracle thing. Is that right? They blessed it. They sort of so they made this pineapple magic or something. Yes, yes, the magic make it pineapple. Magic. Have you heard of any any miracles happening? Any cures? People have had the pineapple or the apple or something and then they've got better or got more healthy? Or... It's just like the story but yeah. no one can prove it. Is yeah, that sure. the real one or not? Is that true or not? Yeah. But we still believe it. On my travels around Asia, I've met all sorts of strange people who do crazy pain-inducing things to themselves. And here at Oxford University, they think they may have found a reason as to how those people can cope with that pain. Katja Veach is a researcher on the project. She's testing how people with strong religious beliefs respond to pain. The experiment is straightforward. For an hour, volunteers are shown at random either a religious or a non-religious image. And while looking at those two images, they're given an electric shock. For each shock they get, they rate the pain on a scale of 0 to 100. Hi, Katja. Hello, Chris. Hello. How <laughs> Hello, how are you? Very well. Take a seat. OK. So I'm going to be your guinea pig today. Mm -hmm. You're going to do some experiments on me. What are you going to do? What I would like to do is, I would like to apply painful electric stimuli to the back of your hand. That is not going to be painful, so there's no current now. If you're familiar with meditation, for instance, have you done meditation before? Then it will be easier for you. Just try to focus on the picture. If your mind starts wandering, go back to it. Having trained as a Buddhist, Buddha is one of the two images I'm shown. Let the torture begin. <laughs> but before the test can start, Katja's got to establish where my natural pain threshold is. Anything? Yeah, yep. How is it now? Yeah, it's painful. Okay, so if you're ready, then we can start the experiment. We will switch off the light now and start. Yep. Okay, excellent. What underpins this research is the theory that the brain of someone who's happy generally experiences less pain. And as a Buddhist, I should find that this image is more comforting, while this image is of no help whatsoever. And after each image, I have to write how much pain I feel. I expected the two images to have no difference whatsoever. This picture of the Buddha was something that I could um, focus on more to help stop the pain. Okay. It's okay? Yeah, it's fine. Good, excellent. Scarred for life. <laughs> we think that probably religious people have something uh, that helps them dealing with pain much better than atheists. Buddhist abbot Mu Xinhua, ghosts and spirits really do exist and result from a sudden and unexpected death. These people all believe that spirits are causing them bad luck and illness and they've asked for the abbot's help. The abbot will perform an ancient exorcism ceremony where she makes offerings to appease the ghosts and spirits and hopefully send them into the spirit world. The chanting continues like this for nearly three hours and food offerings are made. The theory is that once they're well fed, the ghosts will be ready for their journey into the next life. The names of the spirits are burnt to symbolise their rise into heaven. After the flames go out, 
this girl started getting emotional. Suddenly the lights go out and dried red beans are thrown around the room. Apparently, spirits don't like red beans. The girl then faints. She wakes up and starts going berserk and then collapses again. So she started seeing ghosts all around her. Mm -hmm. That's what freaked her out. Not surprised to freak anybody out, that wouldn't it? She actually feels warm to the touch, but she's experiencing cold and she's shaking as if she's freezing cold. But she's actually quite. Hot. Mm -hmm. She said she didn't. She said she didn't know that she passed out. And you can tell that's true because she cracked her head pretty hard on the floor. I heard it. Um, she, just, she wasn't trying to protect herself. She just went straight out like a light. And the old big pupils, like, uh, giving it. The feet were shaking as well. I mean, I've seen a couple of these things in Asia, and um, that was one of the more imp impressive ones to me. It, it might not have looked like much to yourself if you're sitting there and expecting sort of heads to spin and people to start jumping around and screaming and speaking tongues but that was impressive to me for a couple of reasons because the girl certainly believed it she wasn't putting that on and you, you know she wasn't being pressured into doing anything when I mean, she was out you looked at her eyes they were they were big and wide shaking around dancing and um, she cracked her head really hard um, she's gone into shock now so could could have been sensory overload you know she's been sitting here chanting for three hours bells going off someone screaming at you throwing things at you you know it's kind of every sense is kicking off at the same time What do you usually do on a Saturday morning? Watch the football, or play a game with your mates maybe, or if you're anything like me, sleep off the night before. Here in Chamali, in the goddess Kali temple, they come down bright and early to appease their goddess by sacrificing animals. That's the goddess Kali, cutting the heads off and squirting blood all over. Kali is the Hindu mother goddess of creation, preservation and destruction. Oh, and she's got an insatiable appetite for blood. As you can see, she likes heads. A visit to the Kali temple is a family day out. You can see the line of people that stretches back here. There is thousands of people here on a Saturday morning all bringing their sacrifices to the goddess of Kali. Kali looks after those who look after her. She brings riches to the poor, revenge to the oppressed, and newborn joy to the childless. I mean, this is the most, probably, the most legal extreme form of sacrifice now, because they can't sacrifice humans anymore. It's not allowed. Just 200 years ago at the Kali Temple, Calcutta, a little boy was sacrificed every single day. Now, we're not allowed inside the actual slaughter pit, which is just there, because we're not Hindus, but we can get a close look if you come over here. There are still rumours of human sacrifice to Kali taking place, which have been perpetuated in Hollywood films like Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, but there's definitely no sign of it going on here. Oh, another goat. A headless goat. Can we have a look at the head? Uh, they will eat the goats after they've slaughtered them, so they don't, they don't just waste it. To you and me, this might all seem very macabre, but here it's part of daily life. In fact, we all make sacrifices in our own way. So I give up things. You know, you give up your time, don't you, for money. You go to work, or you give up your 
effort, you go to the gym and you exercise and you train and you get something in return. And that's basically the essence of what sacrifice is all about. There are literally every Saturday morning hundreds of slaughters here. My teacher always used to say to me, I say, how do I become a better martial artist? You say, you, you get out exactly what you put in. It's that, that, that balance. Give something to get something. I don't know if I'd want to slaughter my pets though. I'm here to meet a tarot tribal healer who's using a very rare method to try and heal a very common problem, backache. This guy's got shooting pains in his back. This is probably not a practice that I would use for my backache. Before the Tarot Tribe healer begins, he performs a ritual to appease the healing spirits. The procedure can now begin. Back home, this treatment would probably make the front pages. Look at this thing, the hot poker. So this, this is it another ancient practice of putting heat into his hands and putting it onto the spot of pain and one thing that we do know well, right now is that um, quite often lower back pains are caused by seizures uh, muscle tightening so those two two muscles structure that goes down the lower back and heat can switch those muscles off and then stop the nerves being trapped and loosen the pain and if you come and spend half an hour lying down with a guy that you believe in then you know that can also help those muscles relax and loosen off the pressure in the spine. Master Mary's feeling, and he just said that uh, he just feel he just feels a kind of heat sensation. He can't feel any. He doesn't feel any better yet, but he he's hoping they give him some aspirin later. Mm -hmm. And in the next village. Just on the other side of this field, the local healers have opened their surgery for the day. These three fellows here are the local villagers healers. One of their wives is very ill and they're performing this ceremony today to try and make her better. What he's doing now is specifically asking the goddesses of the village um, the reason as to why his wife's uh, ill. These rituals have been performed for hundreds of years and even with today's modern medicine, surprisingly, they're still the preferred method of diagnosis and cure. There's a local clinic down the road um, that was set up by uh, some Western people to help the locals and nobody goes there at all since, since it's been opened. Back in the first village, the healer treating the man with the bad back is using some traditional pain relief. This is the milkweed leaf and it's called milkweed because it's a weed and it secretes a kind of milk. He's heating this and putting it onto the back and this, it's said, has a quality of numbing the pain. The healer's treating the sick wife for finished doing their diagnosis. He's just discovered the reason that his wife's ill. This is definitely not the kind of condition you'd be taught about at med school. Someone's put a curse on a, a witch in another village, and they're now going to send that curse back. She's been coughing a lot and getting headaches and getting dizzy. Thought it might be the incense, but no, it's a witch in the next neighbourhood. This piece of wood here, with the paintings of the different colours on, uh, that's sitting in a fishing net, is the thing that they are using to try and catch the evil curse. What they do with the wood wrapped in the fishnet, stick it in there and then stick it underground 
in a nearby village and wait until his wife gets better, free from the curse. When she gets free from the curse, they'll dig it out again and send it into the river and set it free. The man with the back complaint is about to receive the last part of his treatment. This is the kind of procedure that I'm not sure we'd get, even if we went private. What he's doing now is he's trying to suck out the negativity in the fella's back. For the people in Nepal, this kind of treatment's just part of everyday life. Just like you or I popping out to see our GP. He's saying that um, that old fella, when he was sucking on him, sucked out these little bits of dirt and stone and then gobbed them into this metal tin and that's what he thinks is going to cure him. How you, how you feeling? Yeah. yeah. Good? Yeah? yeah? Feel better, yeah? to the Guru Hanumanakara, a wrestling academy in Delhi. This ancient martial arts, a hard discipline of mind and body, practiced in a monastic, almost religious environment. Every morning, the wrestlers prepare the space where they'll spend the next 10 hours exercising, wrestling and resting. The fighting arena is prepared with a combination of delicate ritual cleansing to appease the monkey god and back-breaking physical labor. The wrestlers warm up with a succession of demanding exercises. Logging on here is a lot more strenuous than for the average office worker at his computer. So, sanctified, the space is now ready for some scrapping. could well be sitting there at home thinking what they're doing, it's mud wrestling, what's that got to do with martial arts? But you can see quite clearly that a lot of the techniques, they're restraining the techniques, you just had them in a hold, you know, the police use that, that's a martial arts technique. Leverage, that's another martial arts technique. He's holding the guy so he can't move, they're not getting hurt, they're not punching each other. But this is an integral aspect of martial arts, wrestling, groundwork, very important. Mm. So you see these are you know, judo, the art which is popular now, is only a couple of hundred years old, but some of the moves here are very similar to judo. Now you can see quite clearly why they're wearing pants, not clothes like this, because there's nothing much to hold on to the body, so the technique has to be clean. And you can see they're trying to grab the pants and use it as for leverage to throw the other guy. Last dominator. I had a chat with coach and former champ Sandeep to find out what are the do's and the don'ts of Indian wrestling. Pull and throw, yeah. Okay. Okay. They land on the back. Yeah. Oh, your back. Okay. Yeah. And then, yeah, then you would. Oh, okay, 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 okay. The rules are pretty simple. You grab them around the waist, around the pants, lift them up, chuck them down when they hit the floor on the back. You want a point. Okay. And um, do you have, uh, do you lock, lock, lock the arms? Do you lock? No, no. So there's no finger locks. <laughs> No arm locks. Uh, what about head, head locks? No, no, no. No head locks. Okay, good. I got to practice some of the basic moves helped by one of the Akara's most senior champs. These are a warrior cast, controlling mind and body in a monastic lifestyle. They train hard for 10 hours a day. They're good fighters and honest, straightforward blokes. The Akara has got a hundred men aged between 15 and 30 years old all living on site. And in accordance with ancient tradition, they live here 24 seven with no women anywhere to be seen. I've heard it said that historically, Indian wrestlers are required never to ejaculate during their fighting lives. I asked Sandeep if this was still the case. 
क्योंकि जो हमारी मेहनत है वो रंग ला चुकी है ओके ऑल राइट सो ही सेइंग दैट इन द ओल्ड डेज दे नेवर यूज्ड टू गेट मैरिड बट नाउ अ डेज दे डू आफ्टर द एज ऑफ 28 टू 30 बिकॉज़ बाय देन यू हैव ऑलरेडी डन इनफ ट्रेनिंग 15 और 20 इयर्स सो दैट यू यू नो यू गॉट द स्किल एंड यू नॉट गोइंग टू लूज टू मच पावर बाय गिविंग इट टू द मिसेस दो महीने कोई बात कोई बात नहीं Yeah. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> it's just a little bit of sex is fine, but if you do it continually, it's uh, it's just going to make you tired. Yeah. So, just at the weekend or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In Nepal, there's a Hindu sect that's got a unique way of practicing abstinence. One of their followers has agreed to show me this ritual. This whole sect believe that if they can destroy their erectile tissue, that basically means boys, none of that, yeah, then he won't be interested in sex and so he'll be more spiritual. And what better place to see it than a graveyard where the only audience are monkeys. Probably another one of those things you don't want to try at home. Does that hurt? Painful. Yeah. But just like me before I perform martial arts, this is just a warm up. Uh, that's a tombstone. block of marble and there's a bunch of bricks it's all about respect for the dead human race. I mean, why would people do it? Who thought of this, you know? That'll make you a better man. Tomorrow on 3 we have another excellent movie from BBC 3's British film season Man Dancing and a former hard nut tries to prove these change these ways that's at 11 mind and body I'm Chris Crudelli and I spent my entire adult life studying martial arts and philosophy in the Far East This series is my journey of exploration through that world meeting people who perform incredible feats in mind and body Today I meet people who as a result of their unusual powers lead extreme lives. In Thailand near the border with Burma 800 people have been eaten in the last 30 years. They got a problem with tigers and locals have hunted them to the point of extinction. At this monastery, Buddhist monks have come up with an extreme solution to tiger conservation. They live with 18 resident tigers who they say are reincarnated monks. To me though, they're still tigers and one of my greatest fears. I've come here to both meet the reincarnated monks and face my phobia. Going to meet the abbot now. I've had a bit of breakfast with him, but I'm a bit disturbed because uh, the tigers are supposed to be in cages and they're actually wandering around here. So I'm not sure if there's any up here or not. There's a huge tiger there. <laughs> Do I want to be having breakfast with with the tigers? Not really. I don't want to be their breakfast either. Nice one. The Buddhist abbot here believes that the tigers won't attack anybody because they're reincarnated monks. 
the big tigers are very big. Yeah, very big. Yeah. Are, they, are they dangerous? Yeah, in in, yeah. in the jungle it's very very dangerous. Yeah. But in here it's not dangerous. It's okay. like a friend. Yeah. yeah. We are we are stay here like a big family here. Mm. We 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 believe a real connection. Yeah. We we think it's a, the tiger here is a, like a my old friend. Yeah. So the body looks like a tiger. Yeah. But before it was a monk. It was a monk. Yeah. Tigers are probably getting a bit jealous. They haven't eaten yet. They're starving. Feed them some brummy later. This is Dr. Sum Chai. He's the main vet here. He's been here for six years, so he's got some experience of handling the tigers. And he's seen a bit of action in his time as well. Um, and he can give me some pointers how not to get eaten. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So first, uh, and fundamental regulation here is... Yeah. Uh, please don't turn your back in front of the tiger. Don't turn my back in front of the tiger? Yes, facing with them. Okay, facing what happens if them. I do that? Once you turn your back, the tiger will jump to you, okay? And the second, uh, don't show your fear, okay? He can sense my fear. Yes, sense your fear. Tiger really? is very, very, very clever and know. If it... you show a sign of fear, you're taking us, you have something happen, yeah. they will come to you. To help me overcome my fear, I first meet some of the temple's little Buddhas. Ah! How beautiful. Look at you. It's amazing to think that something so gorgeous in a couple of years is going to be the most ferocious killing machine on the planet. We're taking a trip down to the quarry where there's nine tigers waiting. I'm personally cracking myself. It's midday, the tigers have had their lunch and they're now sleeping it off. I'm about to get very close. Abba's gonna take me in now. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Sit down. Personally, the last thing I'd want while having a siesta is to be pushed and prodded. This is fun, isn't it? These may well be reincarnated peace-loving Buddhist monks, but let's face it, they're also wild animals. Tiger handle as a present, just in case things do kick off. Yes. No, not so you, can see, you can see the teeth. Cut the teeth. Yeah, big teeth. Yeah, you cut, cut Touch it. the teeth, yeah. yeah. Okay. And I need to be absolutely calm in my mind, so as not to wind okay. it up. I'm kind of hiding my fear, really. I don't know if I'm doing a good job or not. But I am bricking it. I can't remember what he means about chilling out and feeling the love. Because it's a beautiful creature. Striking a tiger's head. Unreal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you see the teeth? Yes. Huge claws and paws. It's very big, isn't it? It's yeah, beautiful. 175 kilo. Really? He's not sleeping. He yeah. listen, yeah, you see, yeah. Oh, so he's not, oh, he's not yeah. sleeping, he's, he's yeah. actually... Yeah, he listen, he's... Yeah, he's listening. Right. <laughs> he's listening. Okay. Thanks very much for thank that. Thank you, thank you. I uh, feel like a new man. <laughs> See ya, mate. See ya. <laughs> to be honest, when I went in there, I didn't feel... I didn't feel as much fear. I could feel, like, old habits of fear going like that, you know, coming back and... But then I was with him, he was calm, everyone was calm, you know, the tigers are calm. All right, if I can stay in that calmness, that tiger's not going to eat me, and, and, and it didn't. If I can keep my mind calm, I'm not a target. He doesn't see me as a target, he doesn't eat me. He could eat me very easily, but he didn't. So that's one way of beating a tiger, isn't it? Mind over tiger. This is the Shaolin Temple in the mountain province of Hernan. 1,500 years ago, a monk named Damo traveled from India with sutras and yoga. He taught the monks, they turned it into Kung Fu, and it spread from there. 
Kung Fu was developed by Shaolin monks as a form of self-defense against robbers and bandits. And through fighting, they developed their own form of medicine. Kung Fu, it takes it out of you. It does. You're fighting all day, or you're training, you're punching bricks, walls, trees. So they've got a culture of um, herbalism to fix bones and also to prevent long-term injuries like arthritis and stuff like that. I'm excited. This is the inner courtyard of the Shaolin Temple, and I'm here to meet a very special man, Master Dergien, which means health and virtue. He's a kung fu fighter, he's a top guy here, he's a herbalist, and he's a Zen master as well. The master has agreed to show me a little bit of his internal kung fu, the secret style that the other monks here don't know about. So the difference between um, internal and external kung fu is that external is the first stuff that you learn to make your body hard and tough. It's all about that sort of stuff and, you know, being hard. And then you progress after 10 or 20 years to the soft stuff, moving people's force against them. Grab the nuts and the chin at the same time. Straight under. And see, he's got my leg. He took my leg at the back there, so I can just flip you over. <laughs> oh. Fucking hit me in the nutsack again. <laughs> so he's saying, if you hit high, I'll hit low. You hit low, I hit high. Ah. Okay. Ah. Ah, yeah. I need some of that medicine now. We are. We'll die our young nigga, yeah. <laughs> I've been practicing martial arts for over 20 years and my body's taken its fair share of punishment. So Master Dergien has produced a potion to help my aching joints. He studied medicine, but uh, not traditional Chinese medicine, traditional Shaolin medicine. They're all local herbs used from Songshan, which is the mountain just behind. He's saying that um, another difference is that the monks here um, because of their practice of Kung Fu, they have a very deep understanding of the human body um, from the inside rather than just like a textbook. And also they understand the Qi and the Qi meridians that run through the body because they know how to feel them, not just to read about them. By being able to channel Qi, the Shaolin monks are able to protect their bodies from outside forces. <laughs> because Qi is something, he said, that you can't see or you can't touch as such then they're able to pull the chi through the body the negative chi and, and you've got to think that in chinese medicine disease is thought of as a originally an accumulation of bad chi or a block of bad chi so they'll move that bad chi and that should improve the situation from its origins at the shaolin temple Kung Fu has evolved into many other martial arts. And this is Wushu, the modern version of Kung Fu. It's great, isn't it? Imagine sending your kids here. There are 5,000 kids in this particular school, and they're all here for one reason. To train until they're as hard as nails. As a martial artist, I do a lot of training. Some of it physical. A lot of it mental. Today, using these blocks, I'm gonna show you how it's my mind and not my body that allows me to do things some people think impossible. It's not just the mind, it's also simple physics. I'm at the National Physical Laboratory in Teddington to find out about an apparently miraculous physical feat. I'm gonna to attempt to do something I've never done before, and that is break through these four Turbine stones with my bare hand, and I'm at the lab to test exactly how much force is required to do that. Brian, is it possible? Well, 
Yeah, it's possible to break concrete if you put enough energy in there. What actually are you doing here? A block of concrete is just a load of molecules at a right. fundamental level. They're all stuck together. Yeah. And what you're going to do if you break them is break the molecules apart. Hopefully. And you've got, hopefully, or either, your hand, either, either depending on how you hit it. the molecules in my bones. Exactly. Yeah. Some molecules are going to get broken. And you've got to put in energy to do that. Yeah. And that, that's a defined amount. We could work it out. Would you ever go? Well, no, because I'm absolutely confident if I hit that as hard as I could, I'd break my hand because I'm not trained. Now whether you break your hand or you break the concrete, I'm going to be interested to see. <laughs> but, but we can at least go and measure how much energy we've got to get in, what force we've got to apply to break that on a machine over there. Okay, brilliant. Let's have a look. Using complicated mathematical formulae, the physicists calculate the force required to break the concrete blocks. Okay Mike, so you've set up the blocks in exactly the same way that we're going to do over there. Is this as close as you could get to replicate the power required to break four blocks. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's fairly uh, representative of what we're seeing in, in practice. Um, obviously, we're trying to replicate the speed of your hand as it hits the blocks and the same contact area and hopefully the same energy that you're putting in when you break the blocks we're getting in, the, in this test. So you get a more accurate reading of exactly how much force is required yeah, to what happened, something. how much right. force was applied and when it happened. Bonus. <laughs> Force time trace. So we can see that we're loading up from zero, that's the initial force, mm -hmm. up to a peak of just over 20 kilonewtons. I suppose the other way to think about it, how much weight did you drop there? Was it six kilo, kilograms? Six kilograms. Yeah. Do, you, do you imagine dropping a six kilogram weight onto your foot, yeah. which is essentially what you did there, from about here? It's going to hurt, right? Yeah. Six kilogram weight onto your foot. You're not helping me. <laughs> You're not helping me. So the indenter test tells us I've got a strike with a force equivalent to dropping a 10-pin bowling ball on my foot. I visualise a point below the concrete blocks and I aim for it. I need to make sure my hand speed's not compromised. My strike force has got to be greater than the resistance offered by the blocks. to break the bones in your hand. Obviously, if you just don't get it exactly right. Yeah, yeah. It might look impressive, but with the right training, anyone can do it, and it can be explained by simple physics. As I strike, I snap my hips, drop my body weight, concentrating all my mass through the smallest point in my hand, and smash the concrete. Muay Thai, otherwise known as Thai boxing, is Thailand's national sport. This is Lumpini Stadium. This is Thai boxing. Muay Thai is an extreme form of boxing. It's not just about punching. Elbow strikes and kicks are used to devastating effect. He's been knocked clean out, third round, because with an elbow strike, and you know elbow strikes are really bloody hard. So he, he moved in, he moved in, the guy saw an opportunity, just clocked him with his elbow, knocked him straight out cold. You see, he's in a bit of a state in it. That is, the, that is the kind of shot that will kill you or paralyse you because it breaks your neck and you see it all the time here. People are stretched out, they're, they're not always in as good a state as him. You know, they're either stretched here if they're all right or stretched in the mortuary.
This gym is where Thailand's top fighters train. Anawat is renowned for his devastating punches and his uncompromising walk-forward style of fighting. This is Anawat. He's one of the best boxers in Thailand at the moment. And he's, he's known for his knockouts. You can see his punches are massively hard. Beautiful kick. Rob Cox is working at the gym to encourage us Brits to come to Thailand and try this brutal sport. So, what's the secret? You know, mm. 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 Well, lay. Mm. It's, uh, it's all down to the training. You know, yeah. we have to train very yeah. hard. That's a mo that's a priority. Yeah. Yeah. But also down to a lot of it's down to the actual technique as well. Not just yeah, throwing yeah. the arm out straight. Like yeah, it's yeah. showing there, he's using the wrist as well to put power into the shot so he's and the shoulder the as well. Yeah. Okay. Before the power's coming up through the body and the yeah. weight's shifting yeah. onto the front leg. Yeah. Then when you're throwing yeah. the punch, you're aiming the targets the throat there. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Aim for the throat, because people's natural reaction is when you go for the throat, they drop down, so you hit them straight on the chin anyway. So, you see, they yeah. go down, so you hit them on the chin. Yeah. Yeah. That's what 30 years of experience gets you. Simple, clean techniques, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm still telegraphing as well. <laughs> I'm, I'm finding that what I'm doing is, I'm sort of going, you know, and, and his moves are like nice and yeah, sharp and like bang, so you can't see it coming because if you telegraph, if you do this to somebody, they know what's coming and they're going to knock you out before you know what's what. Yes, yes, so yes, what he's doing, yes. what he's doing is he's hiding the techniques. So he's doing setting, up, setting it up by kicking, punching, jabbing, but in his mind he knows he's going to go for the elbow. So he kind of confuses the other person to backing off a little bit, and then bang, hits him. Yes. I mean, that's hurting through the pads. You can see the guy's, like, wincing. He's, having a, he's not having a good day. That, that kick is, is designed to hit you here where you haven't got any bones, yeah? Just in your kidneys, and that will drop a man easily. Easily. If he, if he, if he plants that on target, that bloke's going down. Yeah, the turning, turning on the front foot, on the support foot. Yeah, see, I'm kind of, like, back, aren't I? Yes! Yes! yes. It's totally different. Yes. That's unbelievable. Yes. <laughs> that is a unique skill of Thai martial arts. It's unreal. Fantastic. Yes. 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 Still in Thailand, I meet up with a boy who has no choice in leading an extreme life. I'm here in rural Thailand with Tak, who I've just got out of school. He's going to show me a very, very special and dangerous skill. This little boy plays with snakes for a living. Firstly, he shows me his practice snake at his house. It's not poisonous, but it'll give you a nasty bite, as his dog discovers. Oh, dear. See where it's going to attack because of the way it coils. It coils sort of two or three times, gets its strength in its neck, and then pushes off the tail and jumps forward. This kid's amazing. Ten years old. Playing with snakes. Look at that, it's just rolled over. He's been playing with it for five minutes, and the snakes just realised it can't bite the kid, so it's rolled over. He's had a go. He's found that he's not going to be successful. So he's sort of given in. But to make money and entertain tourists, Tax got an act at the local snake show where he dances with a king cobra. That's up in the ante a bit, isn't it? That? One bite would kill a man, let alone a boy, in ten minutes. But with his father dead and his mother sick, there's no other income for his family.
I want to know what protection tax got if he gets bitten by the cobra. The show's owner takes me to the side of the road. He's saying that he was bitten by a king cobra because he also plays with them and he used this herb, the Wong Pai Wu. What he does, he pulls it out, chews the root, softens it up, puts it on the wound and then swallows the root and he's still alive. King cobra bite should have killed him in 10 minutes. That's where it bit him right there. It's really interesting. This is an ancient plant. And its, its name is, is the king of snakes, Wang Pai Wu. So people have been using this to treat snake bites for centuries. In case you're wondering, these snakes have not had their fangs removed. I saw one spit venom all over the stage. Look at him, he's, he's, he's right on the ball, isn't he? Look, he's totally alive when he's playing with those things. And he has to be, because that cobra will sense if he's not focused. If he's not 100% focused, that cobra will know it. That's what they look for before they bite. Awareness. The thing that's keeping Tack alive is not his movements, because you see his movements are relatively slow, but his eyes are alive and he's aware, and the snake knows he's aware, and that's why he's not biting at the moment. Are you scared of the snakes? Do you get scared? Is he scared? Why? Why? It's all right, you're doing good, it's all right. It's good, it's good, it's good. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's all right, come on, come on, come on, come on. That's all right, you all right? You good? Yeah? Strong kid. Yeah? So basically, if he doesn't play with snakes, he doesn't eat. And in my mind, this is a scared kid who doesn't really want to be doing this. But he's feeding his family. He's 10 years old and he's feeding his family by Dyson with death. That is probably the thing I love most about Chinese culture. Getting up first thing in the morning and doing some exercise. This might look familiar, but I've discovered some more extreme aspects of Tai Chi. What would you be doing back home? Waiting for your meals on wheels? I probably would. Tai Chi is an ancient form of coordinated body movements, focusing on the cultivation of energy, or Qi. The aim is to harmonise the mind, body and spirit, promoting both mental and physical well-being. As you get older, if you <laughs> practise Tai Chi sword and Tai Chi uh, fist, they call it, which is just Tai Chi, um, it's good for your legs and um, especially this type of system is they use their legs a lot, so that it's good for walking, good for running, anything like that. Having a bendy body is one thing, but can Tai Chi cure illness? Uh, okay. 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 <laughs> I asked him, Does it, can it cure you of illness? And he said, well, you shouldn't say cure, you should say prevent, really. And that's a really important thing in Chinese culture. It's, they're into preventative medicine rather than curative, so they try to fix the problem before it's a problem, if you like. That's much, much more effective, isn't it? Don't wait till you get cancer. Stop smoking. And the Chinese have even found a way of incorporating secret weapons into their Tai Chi. What they're doing in it um, is Tai Chi Fan, which is very, very rare. It's for fighting. <laughs> it's pretty good, isn't it? So you can carry your fan around and cost someone with it at the same time. Nice work. Fans or no fans, practising Tai Chi has helped the Chinese elderly statesman to keep going and going and going. This is Mr Guo. He likes Tai Chi and sprinting. Uh, he's 105. Guo Xuan Xiang. He said that um, it's the most important thing when you get old is to keep exercising and keep moving, and that way you keep your health. He's 105. Look at him, he looks 70. However, for Mr Guo, it took chronic illness for him to start practising Tai Chi. 
basically, when he was 80, he got sick. He had an operation in his stomach. He had something cut out. And um, so he thought he'd better get himself healthy. And he started Tai Chi. He thought he'd do it for three or five years, but he's been doing it for 25 years now. He's still loving it, every minute of it. For a man of 105, he's got the most amazing muscular control. This is, um, <laughs> this is a very good exercise, and I've heard about a lot of people doing this in China, but for muscle building. Rather than picking at weights, they hang on a pole, and they'll do this either at this angle or at this angle sometimes. And as you can imagine, you're holding all your body weight. It's kind of like, like a leg raise or something. You're holding all your body weight against itself. Even with the help of Tai Chi, I'm convinced that today's display must surely have had an effect on Mr Guo. Yeah. He said, I'm not tired. He said, I went, I went around Tiananmen Square yesterday for a walk. I was looking all at Beijing, you know, I spent the whole day running around. Tired? I'm 105, why should I be tired? Uh... Next time on Kick-Ass Miracles, my journey through the Far East takes me to meet people who go to extraordinary lengths to protect themselves. I'm Chris Crudelli. I've spent my entire adult life studying martial arts and philosophy in the Far East. This series is my journey of exploration through that world. Meeting people who perform incredible feats of mind and body. Today, I'm looking at the extremes people go to in order to protect themselves. Come to Lipa village in Batangas to find out all about the Haring Bacal ritual. This is Jess Varallo, self-styled priest of the Haring Bacal group, a Christian cult. He says that this ritual protects the participants from bad luck, illness, injury and even death. He claims to have personally escaped bullets fired at him at point-blank range. The Chris, it's a traditional blade of this region. It looks sharp. We're going to find out exactly how sharp. It's a sharp blade. Right, so this is what I've really come here to see. 36 chops on this fella. Jess has got a huge influence in this small fishing village, and most of the population gather at his hut come shrine to witness the ritual. He's not an ordained priest, but he's risen to that status in the village. The ritual's power to protect is demonstrated by hacking at each of these men with a sword between six and 36 times. See that? <coughs> They're really nervous just before they go on, and I can't blame them either, because that blade's pretty sharp. Well, it's very sharp. Get your head up, yeah? Oh, mate, it's chopping him in the nads. At very least, yeah. this is a harsh physical test of faith and trust. And for one believer, go on, son. a bit scary. Go on, son, don't be scared, go on. Don't worry. Worst could happen is you lose your guts. Calves. They'll squirt. At first, I thought they were turning the blade at the last moment, striking with the flat side. But watching closely, it's clear that that is not the case. Turn up. <coughs> That, that guy's in some kind of like religious frenzy. He's just sort of passed out. I mean, he's not bleeding or anything, but you see, he was just like uh, shaking. They take him into the back room, give him a few slaps, wake him up. Now this one's getting it in the nuts. Watch out! Clothing might offer some protection against the blade, especially jeans, but I wouldn't be keen on being hit wearing nothing more than a t-shirt to cushion the blows. Jess says his prayers protect the villagers from the razor-sharp blade. And I do think that the power of faith and belief shouldn't be underestimated. Miracle or not, these people think they're protected, which means they feel more secure about what life might throw at them. 
I don't believe I'm seeing anything miraculous, but the ritual does demonstrate a great deal of trust, particularly when the cuts are to the neck. Okay. Well, that's a bit grisly. All right, well done, mate. So you can see it's cut the flesh a little bit. Oh, look at that, I'm opening up his neck. Can you see that? Yeah. But that's where his main artery is. If it, if it had cut that, he would. this whole place would be squirted. You all right, mate, yeah? Yeah, good for you. Yeah, can't get a plaster on that. Krabi Krabong is the martial arts soldiers would have used to protect themselves on the ancient battlefields of Thailand. It's a method of fighting mixing bladed weapons with unarmed combat techniques, and it's the mother of kickboxing, or Muay Thai. The school's run by Sumai Masamara, who still teaches the techniques to the Thai army today. The spiritual aspects of the art are very important to the Thai people. So if they do this day in, day out, this ritual, when they, before they do it, before they fight, they've prepared a hundred times. In their mind, they know they're going into battle, they know they're possibly going to, well, they're going to kill or be killed. And uh, they're a lot more calm. Hey! The training's hard and brutal. You've got to stay sharp and not forget it's all about trying to chop someone's head off while protecting your own. These things are only practice weapons, but it'll take your eye out. Yeah? OK, cool. OK, go. One. Yeah, no, you have to get it. One oh, step. Okay, okay, okay. Uh -huh. One. Yeah, then hold it up. Hold it up, yeah. Can I get that next? Yeah. Some more yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Woo, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. Bit of an adrenaline rush as well, because uh, this thing will hurt you if it hits you. And you, you, it's not going to kill you, but you've got to move out of the way quick, smart. And uh, it's a great feeling. It's a lot of fun, this. We up the stakes now and get the choppers out. Yeah. When we attack, we use this razor to attack. You have to get this, this side to block. It's not this side. It's different to some of the other arts, like the Japanese arts. The swords are a lot, spend a lot more time making the swords. They're a lot harder, and they'll block with this part of the sword here. So you get a wider sort of, you know, it disperses the, the incoming force. But these guys, they block with this. They actually block with the blade, which makes a lot of sense because then the force, you, you get a little chip out of the sword, but... As you can see, these are all chipped up, but the force will be dispersed that way into the sword so that the sword won't break, it'll absorb the force. Like, yeah, very clever. If you're a fan of Star Wars films, the techniques of Krabby Krabong will be familiar to you. Substitute the swords for lightsabers. Okay. <laughs> Look at that, that's a bit of a, a bit of a bash in today, isn't it? There's no no um you don't hold their chops here, you know, you go at it. And I guess that's kind of what it'd be like in real battle, wouldn't it? When you're hacking at each other's heads. And it's practical. If you if you if you train hard, then you fight hard. It's as simple as that, isn't it? In the ancient capital of Siam. I put my training into practice. This is another thing you've got to have a calm mind for. 
Remembering the moves, remembering not to chop people, remembering not to get chopped. I wonder how long these battles went on for in the old days, because five minutes of this and I'm feeling about 90 years old. Imagine fighting like this for hours, days or weeks. Manila, the capital of the Philippines. A sprawling, polluted, raw and unsettling place. Robbery at gunpoint and kidnappings are common. And here, that's the reason many Filipinos seek security in the miraculous protective powers of rituals, prayers and mystical objects. And the most mystical object for Filipinos is the amulet. Stones that are blessed by prayer and claim to provide protective powers to their wearers. On the edge of Manila, members of the Filipino police's elite special action force live with their families in a gated compound. Behind barbed wire to ensure a degree of safety and security, these guys put their faith not in amulets, but in ammunition and the rule of law. It's the perfect place to test the miraculous power of amulets and for me to crack off a few rounds. The amulets for today's test are brought along by Don de Goules and the Reverend Jerry George, who's nothing like the vicars in Dudley. They're amulet salesmen and keen to extol the virtue of their wares. Reverend George, thanks for letting us do this test today. Can you tell me a bit about Tell me about your amulets. Why are amulets important? Yes, it's very important yeah. because it will protect you from all sorts of earthly dangers. It will protect you, yeah. your body, from uh, any harm. OK. Would it protect you from an earthquake? Yes. Yeah. Because protection amulet is, in general, to shield your human body. OK. Their amulets are all blessed but untested. Shooting the amulets is how Don and George test their miraculous protective qualities. The amulets are put inside brown envelopes and pinned to police firing range targets and then shot at. I really want to see if this does work or not, whether it's the gun, the amulet or the guy's mind. Got it. Got it. That one's shot. That one's shot. That one's shot. That one is shot and that one is shot. That's no good. So the Reverend Jerry produces another set of amulets to be tested by a top marksman. Five shots. And this time, five misses. You did not target the envelope, he targeted just the silhouette. Oh, OK. All right, he didn't target the envelope, he just targeted the, the silhouette, yeah. which is the... OK. You can explain that away as well, can't you? Because he made a mistake in his mind. So, which is also coming back to that thing that we're finding over and over again. Is it their mind that's making them do this, or is it the power of the amulet? So the amulets are tested for a second time with a new marksman, up close and very personal. Did he miss that? Did he miss that? Yeah. Just missed that at close range. His gun's jamming. Got a gun jam. If they said as close as you want. I'm going to leave it up to you to decide whether you think that the amulets work or not whether it's a case of psychology, whether it's a case of communication, you know. Um, I'm going to leave that up to you.
In Manila, there's a 15 metre tall statue of the 16th century warrior king, Lapu Lapu. He was the first national hero of the Philippines, a fighter who led the resistance which kept the Spanish conquistadors at bay for more than half a century. His life and the rituals he performed before he went into battle have influenced generations of Filipino martial artists. He could change from placid leader to furious fighter in the blink of an eye. Red Bagani is a martial artist who's attempting to create contemporary versions of those warrior rituals. The first step is to cleanse the ritual space with salty water. Ah, uh, this is unique to me. You spread it in a slightly different way? Or? Yeah, I spread it in a slightly different way. Yeah. So you better watch out. OK. Oh, he gobs it everywhere. After a few points, what kind of blade is that? Is that the local blade? Yes, yeah, it's, uh, it's a ge generic uh, tool. The only thing that differentiates it from, yeah, from being a simple tool, yeah, is that it has a it's another edge at the. Oh, okay, it's a double-sided sword. All yeah. oh, right, okay. but for close quarter fighting. All oh, right. So instead of wasting time turning, yeah, you, you just, just push, stick it in. Yeah. yeah. Can so I just? Can I feel that? Yeah. yeah. Sure. Thanks. Well, that's razor sharp. Great. And this uh, specially yeah. sharpened just for this show. Did you really? <laughs> oh, thanks, yeah. mate. That's really kind. Okay, mate, I'm going to stand back and let you do your thing. Yeah. I'll do it here at the crossroads. What Red says he'll show me is his version of the Filipino warrior ritual, which will switch a person into fighting mode. But what I'm most keen on seeing is proof that the ritual will protect him from the hacks of his own razor-sharp machete. Initially, I feel a bit sceptical about Red's claims for the ritual, but on watching his movements, I'm slowly won over. They're balanced and powerful. Each sequence, he says, is about channeling the power of the four elements, earth, air, fire and water. Next, he uses breathing exercises to enhance the protective qualities of his skin, muscle and tendon. Bandage on that. Can you really get a bandage? Yeah. You got a bandage. You get the first aid kits in the vehicle. You're right. Right, yeah. It's okay. Yeah. Shouldn't kick your arm up. Yeah. Kick your arm up. A bit up above your head. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll tie it up for you. It's okay. So pretty deep wound. It's gone straight through to the bone. So it's opened up and he's cut one of them. One of yeah, the main veins there. So it's squirting, but you're going to be OK. Oh. All right. We're you're going to need to just stitch it yeah, up, a, gonna... put a few stitches in it, get a needle and cotton and sort you out. Yeah. Actually, I was wondering why it's taking so long to... Get it into the spirit yeah, into yeah. you, yeah? I said it's taking too long. Yeah. And then it's... I just tried. Okay. Don't worry, it's, it's difficult. <laughs> On camera, it's difficult. Yeah, yeah. This, I've done this, what, a dozen times, and this is the first time it happened. Really? As his blood leaks out, I can't help thinking that Red must have actually believed he could do this. He claims he's done it before. These, these are usually for me. Otherwise, why risk the embarrassment he now feels, not to mention the possibility of serious injury or death? 
and he'll be alright with a couple of stitches and a bit of professional care. Um, I mean, what can you say? You know, it's a sharp blade. You see the way he went through that tree? I was thinking, oh, God, he's going to hack his arm. We're going to definitely see some juice today. I guess that's why they call him Red, Red Bagani. in this area of Turai. This is one of their stick dances, which evolved originally um, as a method of scaring off animals, and these guys still practice this, because on a daily basis, they face threat from rhinos, tigers and bears. Bit of drum and bass in the middle of the jungle. I mean, Nepalis are known for being hard, OK? Nepali people are known for being able to fight. Look at that, there's one fella in the middle, and there's five people around him, whacking him with sticks. I mean, agreed, it is choreographed, but nonetheless, um, these guys are always getting whacked with these sticks, and they're heavy, hardcore sticks. Seeing as I've taken such an interest, some of the boys have offered to teach me some of the moves of the Pesati stick. That's this one. OK. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In my martial arts career, I've come across a lot of different forms of stick fighting. It's quite nice, actually. He's got a nice snap to his... when he hits, so... Um, a lot of stick fighting systems that you encounter, when they're hitting, they don't actually... They'll hit, like, in a straight line through, which is not the most powerful this way. What you need to do is, when you hit, you kind of sting it on the end, so you, so you get that extra power. You know, rather than just clumping it, you sort of hit it and then bang. And that'll send the shock into the body, so that'll hurt him a lot more. No. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a bit nervous now. He was laughing at me five minutes ago. Yeah, we'll teach him, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hit first, ask questions later. That's my philosophy. Having shown me some of the moves with the Pizzati stick, the boys were then keen to teach me another one of their dances. No, I'm not doing that. <laughs> no. they, never think, they never think of using these for fighting, but historically, hundreds of years ago when people were doing this, it wasn't just for scaring off animals, which, is be which the dancers become now. It would have been for fighting, and you can see the moves in there, but he, he doesn't know how to use them. Now it's my chance to teach them a thing or two about stick fighting. Show him, I'm going to just show him some things, how to change, how to change it a little bit. So you, you're going to be the hardest boy in the village. Yeah. <laughs> All right. You got to stop it. You got to start hitting me. Hit me, not the stick. Yeah. Hit me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. 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 So you see the distance in this, the distance, the distance instead of here is, yeah, 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 more close. So hitting, block it. Hit me, hit me. <laughs> He's loving it now, isn't he? <laughs> it's good fun, isn't it? <laughs> Star Wars boy, look at him. The force may be with you. Bang! <laughs> it's good fun, isn't it? Good. So, just five minute lesson. He's learned how to fight straight away because he's been practicing this for so many years. It's good exercise as well, isn't it? Uh. Roadside shrines like this are found all over India and they're hugely important as places where people come to pray and make offerings, seeking the protection of the gods via the local holy men. This man, Sadama, is looking anxious because his offering to the gods involves a seven-foot spike. Many Indian men believe 
piercing rituals have the miraculous power to protect their family against accidents or bad spirits. This particular offering is considered a blood sacrifice. So I asked Sadama if any old passerby could use the spike to satisfy the mother god. So the mother god won't feed on anybody's blood who eats meat, drinks booze, engages in wild deeds. That's me out of the picture then. <laughs> it's a big spike. It's very big. Yeah, yeah. You're going to put that through your face? Straight, straight through your face. Does it hurt? Does it hurt? No, it doesn't hurt. No, not at all. No, are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> After the initial preparations, Sadama goes into a trance. He's getting G'd up now, ready for the spike. And he told me that he's been doing this for 11 years, every six months. I don't see any scars on his face. Um, so I don't know if that's a result of him spontaneously hit. Oh, there's a little scar, actually, yeah. I feel for this guy for some reason. I don't know why. He, but he seems like a really nice guy. He's saying he's doing it for his family, you know, because it brings his family peace. He must love his family, yeah. It struck me that here, this is an everyday occurrence. A man walking down the road with a seven-foot spike in his face is no more notable to you or I than someone going to post a letter. I wish I knew the words to this one, because I fancy singing along. This low-key ritual seems devoid of ego, more humble than other piercings I've witnessed. I see a lot of this sort of stuff all over the world. People trying to strike a balance somehow between hurting themselves or paying off some kind of debt of pain, self-flagellation, you know, whatever that form is. Some form of doing something negative. After about a mile or so, we arrive at a sacred site by the river. With the mother god sated, the spikes finally removed. How will the mother help you now? Quite touched by that whole thing. She says, well, it's not up to me, it's up to the mother, you know. You know, I've done my bit now. It's up to her if she decides to do hers or not. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Good luck to you. Good luck. Next time on Kick-Ass Miracles, my journey through the Far East introduces me to people who use rituals and ceremonies to improve their lives. I'm Chris Crudelli, and I've spent my entire adult life studying martial arts and philosophy in the Far East. This is my journey of exploration through that world, meeting people who perform incredible feats of mind and body. Today, I'm going to find out about some of the most extraordinary rituals people use to ward off ill fortune and even ill health. The Red House in Bulacan was once a Japanese comfort house. In other words, 
a house full of sex slaves for the Japanese army during the Second World War. It was the scene of hundreds of rapes, murders and executions. Uninhabited since the war, people say it's haunted by the restless spirits of those who were tortured and killed here. It's an ugly presence in all of their lives. I've come to take part in the first exorcism of this house. It's believed that this Christian ritual will drive away evil and bring peace to the condemned souls who suffered here. This is Benji Batista, the exorcist from Manila. Yeah. He's going to show me around the house and tell me what he's thinking and feeling about yeah. the place. But before we're going to uh, inside the house, I'm gonna, I want to uh, give this to you because okay. this will be one of your defense so that the condemned soul will not harm you. So take it and I will, okay. I will uh, uh, give you this one. Thanks. Okay? Yep. Benji the exorcist has never been to this house before. He lives over 150 miles away in Manila. Using psychic powers in his amulet, he claims to be able to see visions of the terrible scenes that took place here more than 60 years ago. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh Jesus. The Japanese soldiers rape continuously the girl and then after that smash his head scattering the blood over here until is she totally dead dead Every place, every corner here, uh, have a girl, and then using by those uh, military personnel of Japanese Imperial Army. Lola Pito has lived next to this house for the last 70 years. She confirms with eerie accuracy the exact details of what Benji told me. I don't know what to say, really. You have to be, I mean, you have to be extremely sensitive with this kind of subject matter. You can't go around taking the mick, you know, because it's very serious, isn't it? People raped and killed, it's horrible. The pla for me, the place feels horrible. You know, regardless of what the exorcist says, um, it's just, it's just not a nice place to be, you know. I'm putting on this Barong Targal log, which is their national clothing, and it's white because you have to wear white if you want to go in and take part in the exorcism, which I do. I'm to be one of Benji's team of seven exorcists. I feel like a choir boy. Each of us has a specific role. I waft a can of burning incense around, while other members are scattering salt and charcoal. All three activities aim to bring out the spirits. Another exorcist is tapping the floors and walls with a miracle stick, which is meant to destroy the temples that the spirits have built inside the house. And blowing invisible divine words dissipates the spirits. The tension in the house is palpable. And it gets even weirder when the devil's presence is discovered. All of you saw the face of the devil coming out the wall yes. at the same time. He had seven horns. He had seven horns. Yes. Did you saw seven horns as well? Yes. Really? Where? Can you? Is he still there? Or? As I have difficulty seeing Beelzebub's face, a member of the team helpfully outlines the devil's familiar features. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Let's go. Okay. It's done. It's done. Our work here is done. Good evening, everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. Elvis has left the building. The devil has left the building. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Never come back anymore. No, no. What is this? This is a can of, uh, it's a can of baking powder. 
with incense in. It doesn't have to be a gold ornate thing, does it, you know, wafting around. It's got exactly the same purpose in the local people's minds. And that's the purpose of this ceremony, isn't it? It's, it's either healing the spirits or it's healing their minds or healing the minds of the local people. If you've got a healthy mind, you've got a healthy body. And what better way to spend a Monday evening? There are tales from Rajasthan in India of the miraculous healing powers of the Bhavai folk dancers. It's said that their ritual performance could even cure smallpox. I've tracked down one of the last Bhavai troops still performing in India to seek an explanation for these miracle tales. The performance starts with three dancers balancing pots on their heads. Traditionally, they'd have contained water and the leaves from the neem tree. They crank up the wow factor with more and more pots. The story goes that during the original ritual, anyone who was suffering from smallpox would have been encouraged to take part in this dance. This is the exciting bit, the dancing on swords. Just about anything seemed an option for creating some cutting-edge suspense performed to a kick-ass soundtrack. I love that bass. It's a great bass drum. Temple Bell's going on there. It's definitely a morale booster, isn't it? Fantastic. Where are we in Rajasthan and what are we doing? Dancing on broken glass. Fantastic. What a hero. I'm going to get some of those bells as well. Oh, wicked. Uplifting for the soul, but there may actually be some truth in the miracle cure. As they danced, water would have spilt all over the dancers, particularly those who were new to it, like the villagers with smallpox. So he's saying the Bavi is a dance of power and of worship, and also that the neem leaf um, that's in the pot of water when they dance around. The original guy that invented the dance three, four hundred years ago danced around for seven days non-stop and the water from the neem leaf dripped on his face and cured his smallpox, right? So that's why it became a tradition in the villages for them to do this dance to cure smallpox. Scientific studies show us that the neem leaf has got medicinal properties and so miraculous are they that pharmaceutical companies are now attempting to patent the tree's products. If I had some neem, would it cure me of, you know, I don't know, measles or something? Oh, easy, tiger. <laughs> Thanks, mate. This was this was a this was fantastic. Rajasthan rocks. Mm, yeah. Thank you. Very yeah, much. you're very welcome. Thanks, man. Okay. Keep, keep doing up the good work, yeah. Namaste. Yeah, namaste, yeah. Up the neem leaf. Surprisingly, like India and China, the UK has a long tradition of herbal-based medicines. I've come to Kew Gardens in London to find out how UK scientists are once again successfully extracting active ingredients from plants and turning them into medicines. Professor Monique Simmons is heading up the research into herbology. We're now aiming, by the end of 2008, to have studied 300 species of British plants wow. using some of the traditional knowledge about those plants to help the, target our activities. The old, old folk remedies. Yes, old folk remedies, but also kind of new folk remedies. Yeah. As part of this project, we're very keen to collect information uh, about the uses of the plants um, as they've been used, say, at the end of the last century or before 1945, before the National Health Service came in. 
Monique introduces me to some common garden plants that are now being used to cure chronic illness. So where are you taking me? I'm taking you to, to look at a yew tree. OK. And this is um, a tree which has then resulted in a drug that's actually now been used uh, from the taxus, the taxicol. And there's a range of different uh, compounds now in products that have been derived yeah. from the yew tree for the treatment of cancer. But it's not just the mighty trees that are providing cures. So what have you been doing with snowdrops? Well, the snowdrops have been um, developed now as a, a drug for um, treating Alzheimer's. Galanthamine was um, isolated from snowdrops. Now, you've got a plant here, pretty small, yeah. uh, in fact, endangered in some parts of the world, that has resulted in people being able to find something that can be used to treat a really important disease. What Monique has now proven is that here in the UK, we have a strong history of effective herbal remedies. By merely looking in our own back gardens, we could find the next big cure. She's already identified 10 plants with promising futures. Little white aspirin, everyday medicine you and me take for granted. But this was developed by chewing the bark of a willow tree. At this festival in Phuket, Thailand, local men of Chinese origin perform extraordinary rituals in an attempt to cleanse their village of evil. In the temple grounds, they've constructed a 50-foot high ladder with 72 rungs made from razor-sharp blades. The local guys are going to climb this. These are razor-sharp, yeah? You see these yellow bands? These are amulets. We're not allowed to touch the blades, but they are sharp. Um, there's 36 going up, 36 going down. Three and six adds up to nine. This is the Nine Star Festival. Nine's a really important number in Chinese numerology. The amulets have a sacred prayer on them, which is supposed to protect the guy's feet. First, I thought, oh, I might have a go of it myself, because they'll probably be blunt or something, but having a look at them, they're not blunt at all. No, there's no way I'm climbing up 72 steps of razor blades. It's not my idea of a fun night. Before they climb the ladder, they need to get themselves possessed by the gods of the temple. This, they claim, will give them the supernatural powers they need to enable them to climb the huge cheese grater without slicing themselves. Performing this ritual, they believe, will bring great luck to their village. Whatever they were doing, it seemed to be working. But then I noticed one of them looking worried. Clearly not all of them are convinced that the supernatural powers will protect them. When you look at the second guy, he's sort of semi-conscious, he doesn't look possessed to me, or he doesn't look in a soft like he's safe, he's just coming in and out. And that would suggest that he's going to get put to shreds when he goes to the ladder. Yeah, he's bottling it in there. That's outrageous, that really is extraordinary. Because I thought the things on the outside, you see these silver bars, would be holding onto them and only his feet would be on the blades. But he's got his hands and his feet on the blades. Look at him. These guys do have tough feet from walking around barefoot all day. 
and they would be spreading their weight across the blade, but that still doesn't fully account for the lack of cuts. You can make a salad with that. The strange thing is, not one man spilled a drop of blood. I, I, can't, I can't explain that. I can't explain that. The moon has a powerful effect on the earth, influencing tides and gravity. It also influences cultures through people's faith in astrology. So it's not surprising that some martial artists see it as a miraculous power source for their own skills. One example is the Widu Arnis, or War Escrimador Death Offensive Group in Manila. After the ritual meditation and incantations come the fighting skills. It's very different to practice it in the gym. In the gym, you practice the physical movements. In the cemetery, you try and realise the spirit that's here and take that into your body and you'll have an emotionally different experience and then you're supposed to take that out when you fight, you use that so you're in a different state of mind. Visually impressive, but frankly, I'm not seeing the power of the moon being channeled to extraordinary effect. But then I hadn't seen the demos. Breaking glass with bare hands. Chopping apples with accuracy. Popping bottle bottoms with a single blow. Culminating in one of Master Frank's students standing on broken glass hanging bottles from his ears, filling his mouth with 500 thumbtacks and lifting up a fellow pupil lying on a piece of MDF, all in preparation for Master Frank to smack him over the head with a breeze block. Jesus Christ, salva me, Christo, Christo, salva me. Jesus Christ, salva me, Christo, Christo, salva me. The moon clearly is having an effect, so I ask Master Frank for a scientific explanation. So how, how does the moon help them to be able to have the confidence to do these very, very strange things. So number one, the full moon is, uh, you get the high energy right. because of the high tide of the water. Okay. And there, after that, if the water is high tide, the, the, the blood of the people yeah. is very high. So like uh, uh, other uh, students here, you yeah. want to try to, to tie his legs to the car and then just drag him, go down to yeah, McDonald's. Yeah, another, another car. Really? What? Yeah. Time between two cars? Yeah. <laughs> Let's all try He's a small boy. Yeah. A small boy, <laughs> time to a car? Yeah. <laughs> Mate, oh, wait. this is getting crazy. Gosh, really? Yeah. Are you serious? Yeah. yeah. All right, let's go and do so that. That's right. Yeah, come on, let's try come. it here. Let's fucking hang him. <laughs> <laughs> this eight stone lad has been volunteered to be a tow rope strung between a pair of two-ton vehicles. I wonder if they got this idea from Jackass. I personally don't know what this has got to do with the full moon ceremony, but probably another one of those things you don't want to do at home. Really? I'll see you on the other side, mate. You ready? Are you scared? Yeah. I would be as well. Yeah. <laughs> Having a good time. We've got to put the brakes on. I feel a moment of moon induced lunacy come all over me. I'm in the mood for a moon. I don't think the ritual really helps members of the Weedo Arnis group develop greater powers, so I decide to put my money where my mouth is, lash myself to the two-ton vehicles and prove my point. In my experience, the potpourri and mystical beliefs that are added to some martial arts are just about seeking a unique identity, a way to stand out from the crowd.
I love the moon. I like to meditate in front of the moon. I don't know if their powers come from their moon or from their mind or if they are powers. Um, but I do know this. It's a hell of a lot of fun. <laughs> I love this place. Thanks, mate. Okay. See you later. I'm off. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Back at the Phuket Festival in Thailand, I decide to take part in one of the rituals, fire walking. Yeah, we've all seen coal walking before, haven't we? But, uh, oh, 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 oh. Take a look at that, come here. That's, feel the heat from here, that's why, that's why there's nobody in this section here, because that is hot. How am I going to run across that? How am I going to run across that? Jesus. It's burning me from here. It's burning me, it's burning me from here, let alone getting on it. The reality of the situation is, if I go on that, I'm coming off looking like overcooked bacon. <laughs> Crispy bacon. That'll be me in about 10 minutes. I've got to move so bloody hot, let alone get on there with my bare feet. It's now I discover they used 72 bags of charcoal to make this pyre. 72 being a lucky number at this festival. They flatten it a bit, but it's still deep and very hot. In fact, it's about 10 times hotter than any other fire walking pyre I've seen. Looking at that now and realising the depth, I can see that's about a foot and a half high, of burning hot, red hot coal. It's been melting the metal that they've been using to try and straighten it. Well, I need to make sure that I don't go full of, full of my face, basically. The local guys believe, but how am I going to manage? I know I've got to do that, so it's no good me telling myself, oh, I'm going to get burned, all the rest of it. I probably am. But what I've got to do now is give myself the confidence to get across there as quick as possible without falling over. Any positive thing I can grab onto in my mind, I'm using that now as, as fuel. Vince, I'm not. The man in charge notices I'm not possessed like the others, and he worries I'm about to be fried alive. This guy just took a double look at me and he was like, what are you doing here? You shouldn't be here, you're not one of the boys. That's red. Ready? Ready? You can't keep them in there for too long because I don't know what hurts. I'm all going on that hot coal and putting them in this bucket of ice. But flesh burns for 20 minutes after you've been in extreme temperatures. It's in traction. <laughs> I don't know whether it's a laugh or cry. I'm in so much pain. Oh, it's all started swelling up here. The news from the doctor isn't good. Second degree burn. Second degree burn. Yes. How serious is that? Yeah. Blisters? Yeah. So there will be blisters. Uh, artificial skin graft. How about those painkillers? Can we have those painkillers now? Okay. Yeah, cool. it'd be yeah. good. Be a good call. Within a few minutes, I'm completely knocked out with a double dose of morphine. Come in today. This is um, about 12 hours later after the burns. But um, still got a trick up the sleeve. and open the bandages.
I heal very quickly. Okay. Really small burn. Not serious. Okay. Are you surprised? Yeah. No, no pain at all. Feels great. <laughs> look, I can, look, I can moonwalk. <laughs> I'll leave it up to you how I went from second degree burns to moonwalking within 12 hours, and all I'll say is power of the mind. These boys show me the god they claim possessed them, and they say he's the reason they didn't get burned. But either way you look at it, I reckon walking around without shoes on all day would certainly have toughened up their feet a fair bit, just like the lads who climb the ladder of razor blades. <laughs> Next time on Kick-Ass Miracles, I'm looking at the miraculous ways people maintain their health and heal the sick. Images to have no difference whatsoever. This picture of the Buddha was something that I could um, focus on more to help stop the pain. Okay. It's okay? Yeah, it's fine. Good, excellent. Scarred for life. <laughs> we think that probably religious people have something uh, that helps them dealing with pain much better than atheists. To Buddhist abbot Mu Xinhua, ghosts and spirits really do exist and result from a sudden and unexpected death. These people all believe that spirits are causing them bad luck and illness and they've asked for the abbot's help. The abbot will perform an ancient exorcism ceremony where she makes offerings to appease the ghosts and spirits and hopefully send them into the spirit world. The chanting continues like this for nearly three hours and food offerings are made. The theory is that once they're well fed, the ghosts will be ready for their journey into the next life. The names of the spirits are burnt to symbolise their rise into heaven. After the flames go out, this girl started getting emotional. Suddenly the lights go out and dried red beans are thrown around the room. Apparently, spirits don't like red beans. The girl then faints. She wakes up and starts going berserk, and then collapses again. So she started seeing ghosts all around her. That's what freaked her out. I'm surprised to freak anybody out that, wouldn't it? She actually feels warm to the touch, but she's experiencing cold and she's shaking as if she's freezing cold, but she's actually quite hot. Yeah. She said she didn't she said she didn't know that she passed out. And you can tell that's true because she cracked her head pretty hard on the floor. I heard it. Um, she, she wasn't trying to protect herself. She just went straight out like a light. And the old big pupils, like, uh, giving it. The feet were shaking as well. I mean, I've seen a couple of these things in Asia. And um, 
that was one of the more Im impressive ones to me. It, it might not have looked like much to yourself if you're sitting there and expecting sort of heads to spin and people to start jumping around and screaming and speaking tongues. But that was impressive to me for a couple of reasons because the girl certainly believed it. She wasn't putting that on and, you know, she wasn't being... I'm Chris Crudelli. I've spent my entire adult life studying martial arts and philosophy in the Far East. This series is my journey of exploration through that world. Meeting people who perform incredible feats of mind and body. Today, I'm going to look at the extremes that people go to to appease and invoke their gods. It's late September in southern Thailand, and I've been told to brace myself for some gruesome sights at a local festival. This is the beginning of the vegetarian festival in Phuket. What this guy's doing is cutting his tongue with a blade. Mutilation starts today. This man's in a trance, and he seems to feel no pain. That's because he claims to be possessed. Not by the devil, but by the gods. And he believes that by appeasing those gods, he can cleanse his village of evil. At first, I thought these guys were just throwing the axes around faking it. But then I saw the blood, and I realised they really are chopping into their own backs. As if that wasn't shocking enough, I was told that tomorrow it's going to get worse. I couldn't wait. Five a.m. In the temple, local men of Chinese origin start their day by putting themselves into a trance. These guys, man, it's absolutely crazy in here. <laughs> they just keep coming in. Look. What's that? What's that? They can appease themselves in order to appease their gods. Look at this, look at this. This is definitely not acupuncture. He's putting these things all up his body and they'll go all from his arms up through his face. They're everywhere. It's like Amateurville. Spikes are getting bigger and bigger. Can't be good for your health, can you? They are in an altered state of mind, and you'd have to be willing to have skewers pushed through your face and sort of almost not feel it. They're sort of displacing, displacing their mind. These villagers believe the more extreme the piercing, the more the gods are appeased. And look at that face, mate. It's a bloke with a huge javelin through his face. You know, everyone's just having a fag. What a bizarre place. Check this one out. This is the biggest spike at the party. very common problem, backache. This guy's got shooting pains in his back. This is probably not a practice that I would use for my backache. Before the Tarot Tribe healer begins, he performs a ritual to appease the healing spirits. The procedure can now begin. Back home, this treatment would probably make the front pages. Look at this thing, the hot poker. It's 
So this, this is a, another ancient practice of putting heat into his hands and putting it onto the spot of pain. And one thing that we do know well, right now is that um, quite often lower back pains are caused by seizures, uh, muscle tightening. So those two, two muscles, structure that goes down the lower back, and heat can switch those muscles off and then stop the nerves being trapped and loosen the pain. And if you come and spend half an hour lying down with a guy that you believe in, then, you know, that can also help those muscles relax and loosen off the pressure in the spine. Master Mary's feeling and he just said that uh, he just feel he just feels a kind of heat sensation. He can't feel any he doesn't feel any better yet, but he he's hoping they give him some aspirin later. And in the next village, just on the other side of this field, the local healers have opened their surgery for the day. These three fellows here are the local villagers healers. One of their wives is very ill, and they're performing this ceremony today to try and make her better. What he's doing now is specifically asking the goddesses of the village um, the reason as to why his wife's uh, ill. These rituals have been performed for hundreds of years, and even with today's modern medicine, surprisingly, they're still the preferred method of diagnosis and cure. There's a local clinic down the road. Um, that was set up by uh, some Western people to help the locals and nobody goes there at all since, since it's been opened. Back in the first village, the healer treating the man with the bad back is using some traditional pain relief. This is the milkweed leaf and it's called milkweed because it's a weed and it secretes a kind of milk. He's heating this and putting it onto the back and this, it's said, has a quality of numbing the pain. The healers treating the sick wife have finished doing their diagnosis. He's just discovered the reason that his wife's ill. This is definitely not the kind of condition you'd be taught about at med school. Someone's put a curse on a, a witch in another village and they're now going to send that curse back. She's been coughing a lot and getting headaches and getting dizzy. Thought it might be the incense, but no, it's a witch in the next neighborhood. This piece of wood here with the paintings of the different colors on, uh, that's sitting in a fishing net, is the thing that they are using to try and catch the evil curse. What they do with the wood wrapped in the fish net, stick it in there and then stick it underground in a nearby village and wait until his wife gets <laughs> Once everyone's pierced who wants to be, they set off round town in a procession. Look at this, this is the bizarrest one. They've got a turtle spitting out holy water. See on everybody. Look, they're all getting a bit of holy water. Come on, let's get a bit, let's have a bit. Bless. Now I know this looks and feels more like a carnival than an important religious festival, but the locals believe that miracles are actually happening. So once they've pierced themselves, they've got possessed. He's got the spirit in his body, that's why he's giving them the fruit. You see, see how thankful they are, because they think that fruit's going to bring them luck and fortune. This, um, the, the spirit monk that will give us for, um, like, uh, if we eat this thing, it means that it's very good to, to our health and our family, like good luck. All right, okay. It's a, a miracle thing. Is that right? They blessed it. They sort of, so they made this pineapple magic or something. Yes, yes. The magic pineapple. Magic. Have you heard of any any miracles happening? Any cures? People have had the pineapple or the apple or something and then they've got better or got more healthy? Or? It's just like the story, but yeah. no one can prove it. Is yeah, that sure. the real one or not? Is that true or not? Yeah. But we still believe it. I'm 
my travels around Asia, I've met all sorts of strange people who do crazy pain-inducing things to themselves. And here at Oxford University, they think they may have found a reason as to how those people can cope with that pain. Katja Veach is a researcher on the project. She's testing how people with strong religious beliefs respond to pain. The experiment is straightforward. For an hour, volunteers are shown at random either a religious or a non-religious image. And while looking at those two images, they're given an electric shock. For each shock they get, they rate the pain on a scale of zero to 100. Hi, Katja. Hello, Chris. Hello. <laughs> Hello, how are you? Very well. Take a seat. Okay. So I'm going to be your guinea pig today. Mm -hmm. You're going to do some experiments on me. What are you going to do? What I would like to do is, I would like to apply painful electric stimuli to the back of your hand. That is not going to be painful, so there's no current, no. If you're familiar with meditation, for instance, have you done meditation yes. before? Then it will be easier for you. Just try to focus on the picture. If your mind starts wandering, go back to it. Having trained as a Buddhist, Buddha is one of the two images I'm shown. Let the torture begin. <laughs> but before the test can start, Katja's got to establish where my natural pain threshold is. Anything? Uh, yep. How is it now? Yeah, it's painful. Okay, so if you're ready, then we can start the experiment. We will switch off the light now and start. Yep. Okay, excellent. What underpins this research is the theory that the brain of someone who's happy generally experiences less pain. And as a Buddhist, I should find that this image is more comforting, while this image is of no help whatsoever. And after each image, I have to write how much pain I feel. I expected the two pressured into doing anything. When I mean, she was out, you looked at her eyes, they were, they were big and wide shaking around, dancing, and um, she cracked her head really hard. Um, she's gone into shock now, so could could have been sensory overload, you know. She's been sitting here chanting for three hours, bells going off, someone screaming at you, throwing things at you. You know, it's kind of every sense is kicking off at the same time. What do you usually do on a Saturday morning? Watch the football, or play a game with your mates maybe, or if you're anything like me, sleep off the night before. Here in Chamali and the goddess Kali temple, they come down bright and early to appease their goddess by sacrificing animals. That's the goddess Kali, cutting the heads off and squirting blood all over. Kali is the Hindu mother goddess of creation, preservation and destruction. Oh, and she's got an insatiable appetite for blood. As you can see, she likes heads. A visit to the Kali temple is a family day out. You can see the line of people that stretches back here. There is thousands of people here on a Saturday morning all bringing their sacrifices to the goddess of Kali. Kali looks after those who look after her. She brings riches to the poor, revenge to the oppressed, and newborn joy to the childless. I mean, this is the most, probably, the most legal extreme form of sacrifice now, because they can't sacrifice humans anymore. It's not allowed. Just 200 years ago at the Kali Temple, Calcutta, a little boy was sacrificed every single day. Now, we're not allowed inside the actual slaughter pit, which is just there, because we're not Hindus, but we can get a close look if you come over here. There are still rumours of human sacrifice to Kali taking place, which have been perpetuated in Hollywood films like Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, but there's definitely no sign of it going on here. Oh, another goat. A headless goat. Can we have a look at the head? Uh, they will eat the goats after they've slaughtered them, so they don't, they don't just waste it. To you and me, this might all seem very macabre, but here it's part of daily life. In fact, we all make sacrifices in our own way. So I give up things. You know, you give up your time, don't you, for money. You go to work, or you give up your 
effort, you go to the gym and you exercise and you train and you get something in return. And that's basically the essence of what sacrifice is all about. There are literally every Saturday morning hundreds of slaughters here. Yeah? My teacher always used to say to me, I say, how do I become a better martial artist? You say, you, you get out exactly what you put in. It's that, that, that balance. Give something to get something. I don't know if I'd want to slaughter my pets though. I'm here to meet a tarot tribal healer who's using a very rare method to try and 